but to stand in his stead. So thanks, Mike. Morning, guys. It is great to be back with you again. I think it was last year was the last time I was here. Um, always enjoyable being with you guys. Love the music this morning, particularly. Um, my apologies in advance. Um, my youngest, my boys have both got music happening at school, uh, and so the youngest one has been, of course, put on to his group. First up, so as soon as I'm kind of finished and the service is finished, I have to kind of dash to be over there uh, for him kind of thing. So normally I would love to stay and chat, but this week I have to kind of preach and run, so my apologies. Um, means that if you're only annoyed with me, you can take it up with Russell. Well, this morning's passage we have this morning is a psalm, and it's a psalm that puts its finger on an issue that I think most of us have some experience of, usually directly, uh, but even if not directly, at least indirectly. And that is the problem of really kind of disreputable people that are not particularly nice, who are just phenomenally successful. Um, America has kind of given us a masterclass in this space over the last couple of decades with their presidents. presidents. If we go through the kind of rogues gallery of kind of Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, um, these are all men that by and large, unless you're a super uber fan of theirs, you can see that they're pretty shabby. And yet their lives have been covered with gold. They've been phenomenally successful on almost every front you can imagine. Uh, particularly disappointing for me, even though I wasn't a huge fan of all of his policies, I thought that he was an exception. Um, last year, I was reading an interview with the biographer for Barack Obama, a man who shares Barack Obama's political worldview and so didn't have an axe to grind. Uh, but as he's done the research on Barack Obama for the biography, he said in the interview, he's actually no different from Donald Trump. He just hides it better. And so you can put Barack Obama in that grouping as well. It's not just American presidents. It, it's sufficiently common that even comedy picks it up. Um, those of us of an older generation, my mum loved this show and forced me to watch it with her, will remember the Australian sitcom Mother and Son, uh, where you have the uh, main character after his divorce, living with his mum and taking care of his mum and the interaction. But what was kind of the icing on the cake and what was an already awkward family situation is the younger son slash brother, who is a very successful dentist and is a complete jerk constantly cheating on his wife, has absolutely no interest in doing anything to help his mother, and of the two sons, have a guess which of the two sons is mum's favourite. Not the one who lives with her and looks after her. And it's funny because it kind of rings true. Almost all of us in our friendship networks or work experience or neighbourhood or broader family has that person that person for whom everything they touch seems to be gold, they're like Midas, and they are complete jerks, phenomenally successful, and yet kind of awful human beings at the same time, and it just adds salt to all the existing wounds that already exist. And that's the issue that the psalm is wrestling with. Not so much why do good people suffer, why do the people who should suffer have wonderful lives with no suffering? And how do we deal with that? It's an issue that I think most of us can resonate with. And so let's ask God to help us as we take some time to reflect upon the answer that his word gives us. Father, we thank you for your word and the way in which it shines a light onto the reality of life as we live it. That your word doesn't just paint us a picture of something nice, it gets into the mud with us and actually shows us the reality of what we have to deal with often more clearly than we can see it ourselves. It doesn't just describe the problem for us, it also points us to where the solution lies and where it is that we can take hold of things for the problems that we face. And so, Father, this morning, as this psalm does both those things for us, I would ask that you give me good words to say, words that are true to your word, and words that bring honour to the Lord Jesus and set him forth. We ask that your spirit would take what is said 
can take our hearts and would bring the words and our hearts together so that your word becomes written in our hearts and changes us, liberating us from all the things that drag us down to the freedom that you give us in the Lord Jesus to love you and to be loved by you. And we ask these things in his sake. Amen. So right from the start, or really early on, the psalmist kind of spells out the problem. And that is that these people are just phenomenally successful by any kind of measure that you wish to lay down. They're wealthy. In verse 3, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And then in verse 12, as he finishes the description of them, This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. These people are wealthy. They're successful in their job. They're successful in their property buying. They're successful in their professional and business life. They just go from strength to strength. They're wealthy. They can basically buy whatever they want. Money isn't really a serious restriction on them. And from that position of strength, the longer they live, the stronger they get. They just amass more. They get wealthier. And this money that rains down on them comes with no strings attached. All of their life is free of trouble. Listen from verse 4. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. They're not just rich. They're healthy and happy. They really do have it all. They have the good life. They have healthy, fit, strong bodies. They're good looking. They seem to have an almost invulnerable immune system. They don't catch the sniffles. They don't know what you're talking about when you talk about back pain. They've never seen a hernia up close. And they can't spell the word cancer. They just go through life bulletproof. They're immune to the struggles that exist for ordinary mortals like you and I. They don't just have the wealth. They have the health and the strength and the lack of trouble and the peace to actually enjoy all that money can bring. Their life is just one long ode to the good life. And it never rains on the constant picnic that is their life. And to just rub salt in the wound, if that wasn't bad enough, they are complete jerks about all of it. Listen to verses 6 to 9. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. The telling word is the first one in the set. Therefore. They are like this precisely because they have the Midas touch. Everything in life has taught them that they are better than everyone else, more successful than everyone else, stronger than everyone else, more important than everyone else. And they take that lesson to heart. They stride around and act this way, pushing people around because life has told them that's just how important they are in things. They are immensely successful by every criteria you care to name Compared to them, everyone else is a loser. And so they just tower over everyone else. And they act accordingly. They accept no restraint. They bully and they push people around. They're forceful and they're violent. Do not get in their way as they try and hit their goals. Because they have no mercy or compassion. There is no restraint that stops them. There is no limit to the evil their hearts can imagine in order to get what they want out of life. And they don't just act in these bad ways, they're arrogant about it. If you call them on it, they just ridicule you. They mock you. They just think you're pathetic. That they have no time for anything that tries to put restraints or to call them to account. And so putting it all together, the psalmist goes... These guys act and talk as though they've laid claim to heaven and earth. It's their world. 
they're the controllers of destiny. They're, they're the masters of fate, not just for them, but for others. It's their world. You and I just get to live in it for a while because they have the niceness to share it with us. But that's how they work. They are the uber successful professional or businessmen. Successful, wealthy, healthy, a complete pain in the neck. Bullying, utterly self-satisfied. And the kicker comes in the last couple of verses. Therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? We kind of expect at this point the psalmist is going to say that people turn away from them. Because how could you not turn away from people that ugly? But no, people actually turn to them. And the implication is, with the therefore, they turn to them not despite the fact that they're so ugly people who are successful. They turn to them because they are so ugly and successful. They're more popular because they're jerks who are successful than if they were decent people who were successful. Which is weird, but happens all the time. I gave you the rogues list of American presidents. I left one out. A guy called George Bush. I'm not a big fan of George Bush. He did a whole bunch of policies that I thought were just awful. Torture, I think, is just reprehensible. But here's the thing about George Bush compared to the others. He has spent his time since being president in his retirement painting the portrait of the soldiers who died serving their country in the wars that he started. Can you imagine Donald Trump doing that? Can you imagine Bill Clinton doing that? Obama hasn't done that. He's too busy going on yachts with superstars. Can you imagine Joe Biden doing that in his retirement? Guess which one out of all those guys has no fan club? All the others have a fan club. Guess which person has no fan club? No one has time for George Bush. Now, I can understand that if we had no time for all the others. But he actually has behaved in a way that's reasonably decent in his retirement. He's not saying any of the wars that he did was incorrect. I'm pretty grumpy that he hasn't bothered to paint the portraits of the innocent civilians that died in the wars that he started. But he has the decency to go, these men and women died serving their country and I was chief commander in chief. I'll dedicate my retirement to honouring that. That shows a moral decency that's not there for the rest. And he's the one that there's no popularity for at all. This is just part of how it works. When you combine this kind of bad behaviour with success, people tend to see you as a charming rogue. They don't see you as a used car salesman or a strip joint operator. You, you don't come across as a sleazy shyster. You come across as kind of a, a heartwarming kind of person that's just a little bit round the edges. You don't back down, you don't apologise, you've got charm and everything you do works and our hearts go out to you. There is applause there. And because there is applause, because people go to them, they openly turn from God. These tall nails don't just not get hands down. Them sticking up like that means everyone else who looks to them and sees what they pull off goes, well, what would God know anyway? The Bible might have some nice ideas in it. It would be great if life worked that way. But these guys have got it worked out. Look at how they've pulled things off. They understand how life works. God doesn't get the world that we're in. And so that's the problem the psalmist can see. The super successful sinner who enjoys perpetual sunshine and who gets applause precisely because he's a super successful sinner. And that causes a second problem which he spells out from the very start in verse 1 to 3. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. When I, for, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. 
God is good to Israel, to God's people. He's good to those who are pure in heart. It's a faith statement. It's what the word of God promises. But what happens when the faith statement hits the real world? God might be good to his people, but life is good to the ungodly. Life is good to these people. And so the psalmist tells us that his feet had almost slipped as he looked at these successful gifts. He almost concluded that all of what the word of God says is just empty, pious talk. He almost tossed it in because he found he was envious of the wicked. In his heart of hearts, as he looked at it, he wished he was one of them. He wished he had what they had. He wished he was more like them. And you can see it with me in verses 13 to 14. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted. Every morning brings new punishments. It's a mugs game. I'm being taken for a ride here. All that I've done to keep my heart pure, to keep my hands clean of wrongdoing, it's a waste of time. It's futile. I don't have anything like these guys' success. I don't have anything like their wealth. And where they have a life with no trouble, and their health or their ability to enjoy it, I have a life full of trouble and affliction. And that's a sober assessment. If you take a survey of almost any church, you will find close to zero people within the congregation that live a lives as successful as the kind of people we're talking about. Because we're normal. We get all the normal pains and sufferings that normal people get, the normal load of troubles. And then we also get the unique extra troubles that come from being a follower of Jesus. You get the normal lot, and then here's your bonus steak knives with the deal. You get some more. You didn't want that. It's just thrown in as part of the deal. We've got the set, set, standard set plus more. On that measure, if the goal of the game is to avoid suffering, being a follower of Jesus really is futile. It's a poor joke. And yet you can see that the psalmist isn't kind of kicking a hissy fit as he does this. He's being responsible as he weighs all this up. You can hear it in verses 15 to 17. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God and then I understood their final destiny. He doesn't just get up and start preaching his doubts or his experience. He, he doesn't demand a podium so that he can declare how he kind of can't make the pieces fit together and how his faith is disconnected from what he's experiencing. He doesn't pretend it's not there. He doesn't lie to himself or just tell him sweet stories that are sentimental. He looks reality in the eye. But he doesn't just let it all hang out either. Because to do that would be to betray God's children, his fellow believers. And so he struggles with what he sees with his eyes and how it doesn't seem to connect with what it seems as though the word of God is telling him. And that matters to him. It troubles him that he can't put the pieces together. But he can't just simply resolve it by just thinking about it. It's only when he enters the sanctuary that all of a sudden everything begins to fit in their right place. And that just sounds bizarre. He goes into the religious building and boom, his brain starts working and he can make one plus one equal two. What the heck? The problem here, I think, is that it's hard for you and I to get what the sanctuary is in the Old Testament because it's just so different from what we experience now. The temple, the sanctuary, is the place where God is. It's his temple. It's his throne. It's his palace. It's his house. When the temple is made and consecrated, a, a great cloud of the glory of God enters it, so strong that even the priests can't enter into the building. It's too much for them. And it never leaves. It just stays locked up in the Holy of Holies, the innermost building, the room in the building. 
And the believers in the Old Testament get that God can't be contained by a building, can't be contained by the cosmos. Nonetheless, in a very real sense, God is here. He's actually dwelling with his people in his own house, in the middle of his people. And so he's actually there. If you were in the temple grounds and you said to an average believing Jew, where's your God who made the heavens and the earth? It's quite possible they would say, see that door, go through a couple of those doors and you'll meet him face to face. You won't survive the experience, but he's on the other side of that wall. That's why in the Old Testament, if you want to do business with God, you go to the temple. Because by virtue of the temple, God is Emmanuel. He's with his people. You need your sins forgiven? You go to the temple. You want justice? You go to the temple. You want God to hear your prayers? You pray to the temple because you're praying towards God. If you built the temple in Melbourne and you took a plane, you would be drawing closer to God every kilometre the plane ate up as it travelled towards there. We think of it as spiritual when we say drawing close to God. For an Old Testament believer, when they talk about drawing close to God, it's almost physical. They set their face towards Jerusalem and they just start walking. And every step they take, they're literally walking closer to God, getting closer to the presence of God. And so as the psalmist talks about entering the, temp, the sanctuary, he's talking about coming into the very presence of God. And here's the kicker. If that's true for him, it's so much more true for you and I. Because that whole system has been done away with. It's just a shadow that points to the reality that you and I have in the Lord Jesus. It's a finger painting of a child of the real thing. Not even that you and I get a painting, a better painting. It's a finger painting of the thing and we get the thing. The Lord Jesus isn't just a cloud of glory that comes into a building to make a sign. He's God himself becoming human. To see the face of Jesus is literally to see the face of God. He is actually God with us. By his death and resurrection, he moves us into the very throne room of God in the heavenlies. When he goes and ascends into heaven, he gives us his spirit. And when his spirit comes to us, he makes our bodies into the temple of God. And makes us as the people of God, the temple of God. God is present to us in a way that would have blown the mind of the psalmist. He didn't have the categories to grasp it. And so this solution that he can take hold of by entering into the presence of God, it's your birthright and mine even more than his. Because the Lord Jesus has drawn us close to God as the permanent abiding feature of our existence now. And so what is that sanctuary solution? Well, it comes in two parts. A quick one, as the final warm-up act, and then the big one, which is kind of what you're really supposed to take home. The first instalment is there in verses 18 to 20. Surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasy. The picture he had of the, the psalmist had of the wicked wasn't wrong. It was just incomplete. He was taking a snapshot photograph and he needed to watch a video cam. He needed to keep watching how the story played out right to the end. Here's a guy eating an amazing meal. Has his own personal chef to make exactly what he wants, waited on. And you find out the guy is an awful person who had a loving wife who cheated on constantly. And when she finally confronts him about it, he goes ahead and murders her. And now here he is having this meal handmade by a chef, waited on. And you go, what on earth? How does he get away with that? 
But as you keep watching, he then gets taken out to be executed. He's on death row. That's his last meal. Do you really want to eat that meal? Do you really want a part of what he's managed to pull off? No one gets away with anything. That is the sobering truth of human existence. The story hasn't ended yet. And when it does, all of the books will balance. God will go through everyone's account and he will give them proportionally what they deserve. Not too much, not too little, but exactly what they deserve and will stamp it paid in full and you either stand on your own feet and face that or the Lord Jesus' death takes you through it but either way you get what's coming to you and if that doesn't sober you you don't see yourself correctly because the Bible says that not even death is the end of the story there is a judgment that comes after death and when that judgment is finished All accounts have to be paid up in full. And so it is that sometimes in this world, God gives signals of his judgment, sort of a small instalment to warn people. They do stuff and it bites them. And some people go, oh, all right. They mightn't have good hearts, but they learn from that and they kind of act differently. In some cases, God just simply waits with patience giving them a time to repent. And because God is kind, he can often in that situation just pour out good stuff on them because he's patient and he's kind. They don't deserve it, but that doesn't matter to someone who's kind. And often when God does that, people never repent. They make it fuel to even get worse. So what? It's got nothing to do with you and I. Every one of us in this room is here because God has been patient with us and gave us time to repent. Every one of us in this room has experienced kindness from God that was beyond what we deserve. If he showers it on someone else and they never respond correctly, are you going to find fault with God for doing that? Or do you just appreciate the fact that he did it for you? The fact of the matter is they're not getting away at the end of the story. The fact they won't repent itself becomes even more ground for further judgment. All accounts have to be paid. James reflects upon the same dynamic in his letter. He talks about the rich that live lives of self-indulgent luxury and they rip off their workers. And he doesn't get angry. He doesn't get bitter. He pronounces a woe. His heart goes out to them. Because he says they don't get that they are fattening themselves for the day of slaughter. They are like prized pigs eating at the trough. Not realising that market day is coming and they're about to be bacon. That there's nothing there that's attractive that you should want what that's coming to them. God will stir himself. His patience will come to an end. And when his patience comes to an end, so will the wicked come to an end. They will be ended in a moment, swept away in terror. They will disappear like a dream. Does the fact that some evil people have great lives disturb you? Does it cause you to be bitter about being faithful to Christ? Well, God's not going to give you a philosophical answer to the question. He is going to remind you that the fat lady hasn't sung yet. And when you watch the play of the lies of the wicked, you are watching a tragedy. What is coming to them, if you understand it correctly, is nothing to envy. You do not want to swap places with them. You don't want to cast your lot in with them. You don't want a share in what they have because they are doomed. But the reason why I love this psalm is that's the warm-up act. That's not where the heart of the solution lies. 
Beginning in verse 21, the psalmist just takes us on this thing that just keeps going up. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. When he was bitter and dejected, when he's feeling as though he'd been had, he was being an idiot. He was senseless. He was clueless. He was like a brute animal that just doesn't understand the big picture of what's going on around it and just lives for the moment. It has its desires and it seeks to satisfy its desires. It, it seeks to avoid pain. It's just orientated to the now. The kind of life where you seek to maximise your pleasure and minimise your pain is just the life of an animal. And it's like the psalmist goes, dull, and sort of face palms. And what he grasps is that God's not a vending machine. You can't evaluate whether or not the life of faith is worth it or not, futile or not, by the goodies you get for following Christ. God doesn't come to you and say, look, I'm wearing my Santa Claus costume. Love me. And I'll fill your stocking with all of those things you really wanted. That better Xbox, that nicer car, that bigger house, that bigger bank balance, the medical, better medical treatment, the, the overseas holidays, the successful career, the popularity, the better looks, the, the better, better BO, a better marriage, a better family life, better kids, better grandkids. I'll give it all to you. Just love me. It's a contract between us. That's not what God does. God doesn't come to you and offer you stuff. He comes to you and he offers you himself. God gives you himself. That's what he's doing in and through the gospel. And so the psalmist lists all the things he has from the hand of God even in the Old Testament, so this is so much more for you and I, God isn't far off, trapped up in heaven or locked up in the temple. As the psalmist goes through every bend and curve in life, God is there with him at every point. When things get difficult, he has the maker of heaven and earth holding his right hand, personally escorting him through the hardest parts of his life. When he has to face the tough decisions in life, he's not just trapped by his own limited wisdom. He has access to the one who is wisdom itself. And when the race of life is done, and he has to die, then God himself comes to welcome him into God's own glory. God becomes his own butler to welcome him into something greater than life. The grimness of death becomes a gateway to something even greater than life itself. And so the psalmist takes stock. And he realises that he just lost track of everything of what really mattered in life. Sure, he'd prefer to be wealthy and handsome and fit and healthy and trouble-free and successful and popular. I mean, don't give me any of that, I'd hate it. Obviously, if that's on the table, he's going to take it. But that's not what gets him out of bed in the morning. That's not what sort of puts a string in his step. That's not what he's living for. That's not his bucket list. What he wants is God, not the goodies that God might give. On that front, who else does he have in heaven other than God? And what does he actually desire on earth other than God? If you give him God and then say to him, trade God in and I'll give you the whole world, he'll just go, no deal. He's not giving up God for the whole world. 
But if that's the case, if you have gained God and you're not also given the whole world, have you actually missed out on anything at all? If you've been given what you actually desire. If you're not given all the other stuff that you don't actually desire, have you actually missed out on anything? Yes, following Jesus is hard. Our strength and our heart can fail. But even there, God himself will be the strength of our heart. He'll be the forever the portion that we inherit. And so the psalmist finishes by going two paths. This path that cuts itself off from God ends in disaster. This is the path that I choose. And by saying that, he's inviting you and I to step there with him on this path. This is the path where we make ourselves near to God to find being near to God, to be the thing that we desire, the good thing. That he himself becomes our refuge and strength. So three quick things that I think this psalm teaches us. The first one is this. It shows us how to deal with our struggles. The psalmist here is a model of how to to deal with struggles. He doesn't try and hide things under pious talk that's sentimental but has no reality to it. He looks it in the eye. He names it for what it is. But then, and this is critical, he doesn't allow it to make him step back from God, where he has to resolve it before we can move forward again in a relationship, which is so often the temptation. He takes the struggle, and he brings the struggle with him towards God. And that changes everything for him. God's got big shoulders. He can handle your struggles. He can handle the difficulties that you find that cause you to almost stumble. He kind of already knows what's going on for you. It's not going to surprise him or shock him. But you need him to resolve it. And so the psalmist models for us that you take it to him. And that makes the decisive difference. The second one is this one. Don't envy the ungodly. It is so easy to look at what someone has and go, why do they get to have that? I want that. The psalmist tells us here is, you're not just wanting what they have, you're wanting to be them. It's so tempting to think that it's like a a buffet, where you can just take one of the dishes off and put it on your plate, and you can leave everything else there. But that's not what's going on. It's a set price menu. You either pick this one or you pick that one. If you want what they have, you're getting all that they have. Because you're making yourself on their side. You're choosing their path. And if you don't want what they have coming to them, you don't want anything they have now either. Because their fingerprints are on all of it. Which means for you and for I, the job here is to guard our hearts. When you can see the things they have, that your heart goes and goes, but I want it. You're ruthless with yourself and you say, step back from that. You refocus your attention on the stuff that you have because you have God. And here's the third one. From the very first verse. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And it's easy to misunderstand this and so to lose the wonder of it. To think that what the psalmist is saying is if you keep your heart pure and have pure desires, then God will give you all your desires. He'll give you the goodies. After everything that he said, as long as you make sure your heart's reasonably pure in what it wants, God will give you everything that you want. But that can't be the answer because your heart's not pure. Your heart is grubby. My heart is grubby. Jesus says that out of the heart comes all of the things that make a person unclean. You can weed your heart till you die, which you should, and it will still be grubby and full of malignant desires. If God is only good to the pure in heart, you and I can never take advantage of that. That's not what the Bible means when it says that. When Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, he's not saying only the good people get to see God. No, purity here is singleness. 
If, if I take a glass and I pour water into it, and I don't add anything else, there's just water there, what's in the glass? Water. Pure water. Because it's not mixed with anything else. The pure in heart are those who just simply desire God. And they desire God for himself, not for all of the stuff that he might give them. They're like the psalmist who says, there's nothing else in heaven but you. Nothing on earth that I desire. They're like Luther singing, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, God's kingdom is forever. They have one obsessive focus. They want God. And if they have God, they have everything. And that's Jesus' point with that parable of the rich pearl merchant. This guy who makes his living getting pearls and selling them and buying them and and, and amassing a fortune. And then he finds the most amazing pearl that's phenomenally expensive, but even at that price point is an amazing deal. And so he sells all his pearl stock. He sells the boat, he sells the second car, he sells the first car, he sells the house, he sells the stuff in the house, the furniture, the kitchen stuff, he sells the kids' toys, he sells all the extra clothes, he liquidates every asset. He's got nothing, but he's got a pearl. And you go, oh, that guy, he is a canny businessman. He's got the pearl, and that pearl, he's going to make a killing. Just you wait, he's going to sell that pearl and he's going to make everything back plus more, so much more. And you watch and the market in pearls goes up and he doesn't sell. It goes back down and he doesn't sell. It goes right up astronomically. He doesn't sell the pearl. And you come to him and you go, mate, I don't think you understand how this works. You're a pearl merchant. You buy the pearl in order to sell the pearl. And he says... What are you talking about? I'm not selling this. And you're like, are you insane? You you can't sacrifice everything for that. It's a pearl. And he gets this crazy look in his eye and goes, yeah, it's a pearl. He's got the pearl. He doesn't need anything else. He can let everything else go because he's got what he's always been looking for. And the psalmist's point to us this morning is that's what God offers us in and through his son. He is all that we are looking for. And if we have him, we have everything. I invite you during um, our morning tea to speak with others about the message and to keep